My name is uh, Paul Schumacher, and in this video, I will talk about a paper I did in 1993 in the uh, Strategic Management Journal, and the title is Multiple Scenario Development, Its Conceptual and Behavioral Foundations. Uh, the reason I wrote the paper is that I had spent, I was at the University of Chicago at the time, and I took a sabbatical at Royal Dutch Shell, and I was intrigued with scenario planning, great place to go for uh, for that. And I was about two years at Shell and I tried to summarize what this was about because when I returned to the University of Chicago, many colleagues would ask, so tell me what is scenario planning about? And I would have to pitch it in their discipl disciplinary um, frameworks. So the decision, the management scientists viewed it as a decision tree. And the, uh, the people in OB, the organizational behavior, uh, thought that the change process was very interesting. And people, of course, in more the cognitive side, uh, they thought the framing issues or not uh, overcoming overconfidence, et cetera, were interesting. And then it dawned on me that it is all of those things, but none of it fits really well in any one discipline. And that's maybe why it arose out of practice in Shell and other companies. So I wrote a paper to first do a conceptual analysis. What is scenario planning about? How do we define it? What, what is the method, the steps that are involved? How did Shell get into this and other companies as well? But Shell was clearly a pioneer. And, and I also um, wanted to position it against other methods because if you say scenario planning is not so much about planning, but it's about changing people's mindsets. And that's what Shell very much believed. There are actually other methods as well and in one of the tables in the paper, and I probably can get this up if I know what I'm doing here. And then one of the tables in this thing uh, lists seven different methods, including scenario planning, that are used to enhance strategic decision-making. So lateral thinking and brainstorming, which Osborne and Bono deal with, synectics and what was known as morphological analysis, Delphi methods, dialectic reasoning, which Mitrov and Emshoff did work on, then the multiple scenario methods, requisite decision modeling, well known, and dynamic systems analysis at MIT. And I tried to score, is this a very systematic tool? You mean in the sense that you have an algorithm almost, and then I tried to score it, is it really a, a good internal communication device in a large company? Does it help surface or um, um, explain uh, strategic issues well? What is the problem scope? Is it narrowly focused, bounded? And uh, to what extent is the uncertainty addressed? The uncertainty question, which is probably the most central part of scenario planning. And so the first part goes into all of that, looking at it at the individual level, the group level and the organizational level. And that summarized kind of, um, scenario planning against the backdrop of other tools and methods in the field to, um, to help organizations. Then I thought I should do some experiments on this. And I was teaching at Chicago, the policy course, the MBA course in the second year on in strategy policy, we call it. And I had multiple sections. So I decided to do a bunch of experiments to see what the impact of scenario planning is on people's confidence ranges uh, and to what extent they are able to develop coherent scenarios. And I did a total of about, I report in there a total of about um, six experiments. And I'll briefly mention what they were about and how they were done. But I was, I came out of the decision sciences. I did my PhD at Wharton. I did a lot of experimental work. So I just did it as um, experiments. But these MBA students, some were <clears throat> full-time, some were in the evening program, sections different. And um, they all had, uh, I taught the scenario planning method. They knew the steps and I set up essentially take home exercises where they had to apply this for themselves, either in their company that they're working in, if they were, or in their own life for their career. And it could also be personal, like, should I get married? You know, I left it pretty open because it is after all the technique to deal with complex problems, maybe unstructured problems where framing is important and where uncertainty needs to be decomposed and analyzed. So briefly then, the first experiment I ran was really to look at what impact do, does scenario building have on people's estimates of, of quantities that are in that scenario. For example, I asked them to do scenarios of the, the Olympics were happening at the time, and I asked them to estimate how many gold medals 
or silver medals, doesn't matter, uh, the, the United States would win. And so first they would put an estimate down and then I would ask them to develop scenarios about why this number could be much lower than they initially thought and why it could be much higher. And then I also asked them to provide uh, confidence ranges around their estimates initially, 50% uh, ranges and 90% ranges. And so then I measured that again at a later point after they had completed their scenarios. And then I wanted to see to what extent this had changed. Now, is this a perfect experiment? No, there could be temporal shifts, you know, over a period of three weeks. That if there had been an attack on, you know, some Olympic team, then that may affect the number of medals they have. So these are approximate, um, approximate studies. But the major premise of scenario planning that it widens and opens up the aperture and widens people thinking was in fact uh, confirmed. Uh, with the 50% ranges that uh, people provided were stretched by 56% if they did it themselves. And they also asked in some cases colleagues to read their scenarios, not, not the colleagues doing their own scenarios. And interestingly, the impact of scenarios was sometimes greater on other parties. And that's a raise an interesting question. Do scenarios have the most impact for yourself? Because now you organize your own thinking and you put in data and assumptions that you belief or think are important, or is it even better to get it from other people because, okay, you may not trust them as much as yourself, right? We all think we're better drivers than average, um, but they bring new perspectives in that you might have ignored. And it turns out in th this study, and I don't want to generalize from it necessarily, that the, there was a much greater impact on the ranges. The ranges were stretched more with the, the colleagues that some of these students uh, were also included in the analysis than they themselves. So that was one experimental study, at least suggesting that one impact of scenarios is widening the confidence ranges. Uh, the second study I did had to do with uh, the plausibility or the implausibility of scenarios. So I also asked them to deliberately uh, develop really extreme scenarios, scenarios where they, uh, that would en encompass, uh, you know, so 90% of what could happen, let's say to again, the number of medals, but I didn't only do it with the Olympics. I had people estimate the outcomes of presidential elections, um, and the, the level of the stock market. So some of them I chose, some of these in order to test some of these things and other quantities they could select themselves. And just let me uh, get, report briefly what that study on implausibility showed. If the Scenario is not too extreme. It has the desired effect if you believe in overconfidence and there's a lot of studies in behavioral decision theory that if you ask people, you know, confidence ranges, they make them too narrow. Or when you say, you know, give a 90% confidence level that turns out they only write maybe 70% of the time for all the events where they were 90%. That's not always true, but very general phenomenon, this overconfidence phenomenon. But it turns out that if you give, ask people for extreme scenarios, it may start to undermine their ranges. So if you ask, give me a scenario where the US will win 90% of all the medals in the Olympics, that's almost an unimaginable scenario. Or if we had a presidential election then, uh, George Bush actually, and you ask, give me a scenario where Bush wins by 80% when in the United States, all these elections are very close, 50-50, you know, between 40 and 60, but, um, but even that would be extreme then it turns out that people don't start to believe the scenarios anymore. So there is a fine balance in scenario planning about pushing, but not pushing too far. If you push, you get the, the, the desired effect of wider ranges on key estimates in the case of Royal Dutch Shell oil prices or GNP rates or currency levels. But if you make the scenarios too extreme, then a credibility issue or an implausibility issue arises. So that was indeed uh, established. I also looked at this uh, well-known conjunction fallacy, which Kahneman and Tversky have done research on this notion that the probability of two events, A and B, both happening should never be larger than the probability of A happening or the probability of B happening. And yet, and so I tested that, I gave people, these were mostly political and economic uh, events having to do with currency levels or, uh, or tax changes and things of that sort, employment levels, inflation, and it turned out that when we asked, and this was a more complicated design because you cannot ask people, what do you think the probability is of employment going up by X percent? And what's the probability of uh, the dollar strengthening vis-a-vis, -vis, you know, the Euro by X percent? 
they would remember their probability. So if you then say, what is the probability that both happen, that would be too transparent for them. And if they had to wait a month, you do it a month later, then by then, you know, the world has changed too much that you cannot really use the original estimates as a reference point. So what I did is I gave people a whole bunch of these simple questions and I asked a subset and it was split into two groups. So some people got the individual events, other people got the conjunctive events, and then I could use one as the control group for the other. And it turns out that people do, as Kahneman and Tversky have predicted, that people uh, form plausibility stories and they make a conjunction more likely because they start to put a, as the famous story of a librarian and, and who was described, or well, a person described, and you have to guess whether she's a librarian or something else. And then the data, if it leans in one direction, is overinterpreted by subjects. And that's what exactly happened here. So people fall easily for the conjunction. And what the scenario is, of course, is a set of conjunctions. You're saying, well, this narrative means that this happens and that happens and that happens. And people start to spin connections or causal connection between them that makes the, the, the scenario more likely than the product of all the individual events, the, the probabilities multiplied would suggest. So, the, so maybe here we have an oddity that perhaps one bias, cognitive bias, the tendency to make conjunctive events in some settings more uh, probable than their component parts, this may actually increase the probability of a scenario relative to the statistical. And the, so the more detailed you make a scenario, the less likely it will become statistically because you're adding more assumptions, right? So the, 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 the product rule of the conjunction rule in probability makes that less likely. But the plausibility of the scenario in the sense of the coherence and, and the, uh, the appeal that it has to people may actually go up. So this suggested that you may fight fire with fire. We know that people have lots of biases. That's why we do scenario planning. But if you sort of accidentally, or in this case, maybe on purpose, uh, focus on one bias that counters the other, then that could be beneficial. And that's what happened in that case. I got intrigued with that. So I then did some additional analyses to see, well, conjunctive events in the case that I did were two, two events, so just A and B. Now, suppose we make it more complicated and have multiple events, A, B, C, D, and we look at, um, so I looked at the correlations. Suppose we have three variables, um, someone's height, someone's age, and someone's weight. And we uh, look at what people think the correlations are. And you cannot, it's, it's statistically impossible to say that the correlation between height and weight is 0.9, and that the correlation between um, height and age is 0.7, and then suggests that the other remaining one has a negative correlation of 0.08. So there are some inequalities you can set up, what the partial correlations, what relationship they must have. <clears throat> and I found when I did that experiment, that a significant number of the subjects violated these, in these transit, it was intransitive. They felt that things were hang, hanging together in a way that is statistically not, not possible. And that led me then in closing to do a more detailed study where I asked another group of subjects, so these were all different uh, groups of subjects, to construct an entire correlation matrix. We used Apple computer, there was a case study then at Stanford, I had the students read the case, I asked them then to think about looking forward, what are some of the key uncertainties that Apple needs to think about in the external world? They identified them, I didn't do it for them. <laughs> and then I asked them to construct, excuse me, a correlation matrix of these uh, six uncertainties. So if you have six uncertainties, you have six times five divided by two. So you have 15 cells of a correlation matrix that you need to estimate, which they did. And again, a statistical uh, norm here, if real data are used to create a correlation matrix between six variables, then that correlation matrix must be positive definite. The eigenvalues of that matrix cannot be negative. I mean, you have to go to his mathematical statistics book to, to believe this or see why. And, but there is a, it's a very simple test you can do for, which is, does it have a, a negative characteristic root? And it turned out in, in my study, you know, let me be precise here and look that up again. We had 60% of the matrices, the, that correlation matrices that these students produced were impossible, were mathematically impossible. There's no real data set that you could find 
that actually produces that. Even if you make up the data set entirely yourself, as long as it isn't typical data sets, you know, with real numbers, not imaginary numbers in there, et cetera. Um, then um, these are impossible matrices. So it raises the whole issue of how do we assess the coherence of scenarios? Because if you leave people to their own devices, they will spin stories that are just not possible, that are incoherent. Now, this paper was done a, a while ago. And so uh, since then, these topics have been looked at in somewhat more detail. You can do a Google Scholar search on you know, impact of scenarios and confidence ranges, you will get confirmation of some of these findings. But I still feel having now uh, looked at the literature in light of this uh, talk, I still think the topic of coherence in scenarios, how do you test for them? And how do you help people make sure that their narratives are coherent um, is not as well developed as, as it could be. And some time has elapsed since that earlier paper. I'm surprised that um, the scenario planning field does not get more attention in, in the cognitive science literature in terms of what, uh, what is involved, what are all the processes and especially the biases plus the remedies that can operate. My study was of course limited. Uh, the experimental design is not, you know, super sophisticated, it's approximate. And secondly, um, the, 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 there are no field studies at this point, and that's the problem. If you cannot do easily field studies or scenario planning and get a control group, and uh, some companies do it this way and another group uh, does it another way. But I still think there should be more research. And also I look at a limited number of biases. I look primarily at framing effects, overconfidence effects, conjunction effects. Um, availability bias effects, but there is a list in the behavioral decision theory, um, probably of a hundred biases that have been identified. Not all are cognitive, some are emotional biases, wishful thinking, you know, dissonance reduction, and some are just uh, social biases, the, the difficulty of disagreeing with your peers, uh, and, and groupthink would be an example. So, in the bottom line is um, we should probably do more um, controlled experiments on the components of scenario planning, but with the realization that we can only to a limited extent generalize from that to the real world. And let's hope that in field studies, people who excel at that, that more data will be collected about what really constitutes uh, a proper way uh, to assess the validity of scenarios. And we could look back, of course, that's not done, but many people have produced scenarios. There's very few studies that say, let's look at retroactively how well these played out. And if you develop, let's say, four scenarios in a, a given point in time, and now you wait till 10 years later, and we know what happened. How do you really score well how close these were to what actually happened? And that's not, these are multi-dimensional scenarios, so it's not an you know, you have to develop some Euclidean measure of proximity. And the question is also, what are the lessons? And can you really conclude that if some of the scenarios really missed the boat, that they really weren't, you know, good scenarios? It may have been that the world took a turn. After all, it is stochastic, it is probabilistic. Uh, and that, that scenario that didn't happen and now seems extreme it may not have been unreasonable. You almost need, need to do what uh, historians do and go back and ask, counterfactual reasoning, um, could, how could it have played out differently? So there's a lot of work to be done here and that I think is maybe the positive news, but at least we have some underpinning at least now to get started more on sort of cognitively based studies of um, the, the thought processes that go into scenario planning. Thank you.